Good morning. Here I am at home in my messy kitchen with my kid here who's going to be quiet. Okay, that's great. That was Griffin, and that's um, obviously App since we're talking about parenting. So the reason that I put up with my little worm of a son is partly because his, what we talked about in class, that um, natural and sexual selection has designed parents to, in general, respond positively to their annoying little rats. And um, so we wanted to try to talk about some of the mechanisms that uh, enable that kind of response to these particular stimuli. Can I, you cannot do that on your own. Thank you. Okay. Um, and so the first experiment, you have to leave the room. The first experiment, <laughs> the first experiment that I talked about, thank you, um, was an experiment with rats and looking at the effect of oxytocin on the upregulation of dopamine. So the idea is that the hormone oxytocin is tightly coupled with lactation, which is a crucial part of parental behavior. And so during lactation, oxytocin levels rise and they rise uh, partly because they facilitate muscle contractions and they contract the myoepithelial cells um, in the mammary glands to help uh, squeeze the milk out when the baby is suckling. Um, and in addition, so that's peripheral oxytocin that's released from the posterior pituitary. And in addition, there's oxytocin release uh, in the central nervous system. And the measurement of oxytocin in the central nervous system is a bit problematic, but uh, there are some experiments that show that there's some relationship between um, oxytocin when it's secreted from the posterior pituitary peripherally and uh, the secretion in the central nervous system. So, and this experiment does a fantastic job of showing that when oxytocin is secreted into a rat's uh, MPOA, um, which is what we see here, that's OT, and you see an infusion of oxytocin um, into the rat's MPOA. Uh, you see a, this is dopamine levels here, uh, the response of dopamine to an oxytocin infusion in the MPOA, and that's what you see here on the y-axis. So you see a rise in dopamine in response to an oxytocin oxytocin infusion in the MPOA. Uh, and that's in relationship to uh, a much smaller um, rise in oxytocin when there's a saline injection. So the idea is that when oxytocin goes up during maternal behaviors, and that would be partuition, which is giving birth, you have a huge amount of oxytocin release to facilitate uh, uterine contractions. And also during lactation, when oxytocin is released to facilitate the contraction of the myoepithelial cells, that there's also a response in the central nervous system to facilitate motivation uh, and reward. So that the stimulus, that the human stimulus, which is your, uh, the animal's offspring, um, that your perception of that stimulus is paired with this oxytocin increase, which is pleasurable, so that you then perceive that stimulus as pleasurable, your interactions with that stimuli that stimulus um, are rewarding and there's motivation to get more of that reward. So you want to increase proximity to uh, your offspring, etc. Okay, so, but parenting doesn't work out this way for everybody and uh, a big issue in um, maternal behavior right now is, and for some time, but it's getting more and more recognition, is postpartum depression. So part of postpartum depression, so the, the mother feels depressed. When people are depressed, they lack motivation. Um, and so when mothers are depressed, especially right after they have a baby, this can be problematic because they don't feel motivation to um, provide maternal care sometimes to their kids or they don't find that rewarding. And uh, one of the things that might not be rewarding is uh, lactation. So a lot of moms, uh, find breastfeeding extremely rewarding, are very re uh, motivated to, to do it, and it's very pleasurable. And then there's a subset of moms who really do not enjoy it and uh, would rather not uh, breastfeed, and instead they might use formula. And then there are moms who know that they're supposed to breastfeed and do breastfeed, but just don't enjoy it. So what this study did that I ran out of time on is they... Um, that's this study here. They looked at um, three groups of mothers. So one group of mothers uh, is 
breastfeeding and another group of mothers is not breastfeeding their kid. Uh, but within the breastfeeding moms, there are moms who have postpartum depression and moms who don't have postpartum depression. So those are the moms uh, uh, with symptoms and moms without symptoms. So they brought the moms into the lab and they had um, two sessions. So they had a um, breastfeeding session where the moms who were breastfeeding would uh, breastfeed their babies uh, for, I think, half an hour. Uh, probably about 20 minutes, and the moms who were not breastfeeding their babies, um, I believe they were feeding their babies with a bottle. So they weren't actually breastfeeding, they weren't getting any kind of oxytocin increase from uh, lactation, but they were engaged in otherwise the similar interactions with their kids, holding their kids, feeding their kids. And so what they did is they had this breastfeeding session, and then directly after the breastfeeding session, they had, uh, expose the mothers to the Trier social stress test. And this is a test uh, that is pretty reliably uh, induces a stress response. And uh, it requires people to stand up in front of the audience who uh, is judging them on, uh, they have to do like mental arithmetic or write a talk and give a talk. And this usually uh, elicits some sort of stress response in the subjects. So what you see in the experiment are three different measurements under these different two, two different conditions. The measurements are um, what happens to oxytocin levels in those three groups under those conditions of interacting with the kid, either breastfeeding or bottle feeding, and then the TSST, which is the Trier Social Stress Test. So they measured oxytocin uh, during both conditions, and you would really um, expect an oxytocin response uh, here during the interacting with the baby phase. And then they looked at the cortisol response. And what's really interesting is, uh, first of all, asking, is there a cortisol response? So cortisol is some index of the HPA axis activation, which we're going to talk about next, next unit. And it's some kind of index of the uh, stress perception um, or physiological stress experienced by the organism. So the idea is that the higher the level of cortisol, the more stress that is uh, perceived or experienced by the individual. Uh, also, but remember that cortisol helps us cope with stress. So having cortisol go up isn't always a negative uh, thing. So they looked at cortisol response to interacting with the kid, and then what is the cortisol response to the TSST? And they also looked at heart rate, which is another um, uh, variable that's associated with a stress response. So the idea is that uh, um, when you feel stressed, your heart rate starts beating more quickly, and that's another sort of physiological measure of the stress response. So either of these, um, the interacting with the kid or, and the stress test, both of those could be perceived as stressful, especially for someone with postpartum depression who really doesn't want to engage uh, in breastfeeding or that kind of maternal behavior. So the remember the um, experiment that I just showed you, this one, which shows that when oxytocin goes up in the MPOA, dopamine goes up. So again, the idea is that for uh, mothers who have postpartum depression, there may be some dysregulation, and we don't know if this is cause or effect, but there might be some dysregulation of that, um, either the oxytocin response to uh, maternal behaviors, particularly breastfeeding, and then maybe there's some failure of that uh, oxytocin response to elicit a dopamine response. So that if mothers are engaged in maternal behavior, again, particularly something like uh, breastfeeding, and they don't have the same kind of oxytocin response as a mom who doesn't have postpartum depression, then they're not going to get the same reward from breastfeeding. They're not going to be as motivated to breastfeed because potentially they don't <clears throat> excuse me, have that dopamine response that's elicited by the high oxytocin levels. So that's what these guys set to find out, and that's basically what they did find, which is that, and I'm going to try to just walk you through that again more slowly. So again, this uh, session here is interacting with the kids. The black squares are the moms who are just bottle feeding their kids. So they came to the session, they're bottle feeding, and in general, they're not breastfeeding their kids. They've chosen to bottle feed uh, with formula. The, and this is the oxytocin response to that session. So they're getting a little bit of an oxytocin response because they're interacting, probably because they're interacting with the kids. The moms who uh, have postpartum depression, this is the key point for this part, the moms who have postpartum depression, 
are not getting as high of an oxytocin response or as robust of an oxytocin response as the moms who don't have postpartum depression. So the implication is that this is not going to be um, as rewarding for the moms who have postpartum depression and even potentially, you know, for the moms who uh, are not breastfeeding their kids. So this suggests a stronger dopamine response based on this kind of uh, experiment. So this is also a pretty robust finding. So then what they looked at, so the further implication is that engaging in maternal behaviors that result in an increase in oxytocin and an increase potentially in dopamine have a buffering effect on stress. So the idea is that um, breastfeeding and parenting in general, like I had this interaction with my kid where I'm trying to make this video and he's kind of bothering me, um, you know, that could just be stressful, but instead I think he's cute and I love him and um, I am not completely wigged out by the thousands of, inter well, sometimes I am, but the thousands of interactions that I have with my offspring that might just be stressful and aversive. Um, they're not. Obviously, people continue to have kids even if after they have one because it's rewarding. Um, okay, so that was a little digression, but the idea is that those hormonal changes, um, the hormonal changes of, of motherhood, higher prolactin, higher um, oxytocin, facilitate changes in neurochemistry that make interaction with the offspring rewarding and buffer moms from the stress of having to breastfeed or take care of their kids. So what they wanted to see is what, how does the oxytocin response of uh, breastfeeding or not breastfeeding as the case may be, predict the cortisol response um, to the stress test. And also it's interesting to note that the cortisol response to breastfeeding is highest among the moms who have postpartum depression. So that seems to be more stressful uh, as indexed by the higher cortisol response during the breastfeeding phase. For the moms who are uh, don't have postpartum depression and are not breastfeeding, you don't really see much of a cortisol response here. But you do see that the moms who didn't breastfeed and didn't have an oxytocin, a big oxytocin response over here, are having the highest cortisol response to that stress test. And then the next highest cortisol response are the moms who did breastfeed and who did get somewhat of an oxytocin increase, but not a really robust oxytocin increase relative to the moms who don't have postpartum depression. So the moms who have postpartum depression, who got a lower oxytocin increase over here, are seeing an enhanced or increased uh, cortisol response to the stress test. So they're finding, they are in fact finding that more stressful. That's what's suggested here. Um, then the moms who seem to be very cool down here, who breastfed, who had oxytocin, they're like, yeah, yeah, whatever, a stress test. I'm not really feeling too uh, stressed out by that. And basically those um, patterns are just confirmed down here by the changes in heart rate across the stress test. So you see the same pattern where the moms who didn't breastfeed have the highest heart rate in response to the stress test. And the next highest heart rate are the moms who have postpartum depression and didn't have much of an oxytocin response relative to the moms who don't have postpartum depression. So this um, study also found that the oxytocin and breastfeeding, okay, may buffer the moms from stress. Um, blah, blah, blah. Sorry. What I wanted to tell you was something I didn't tell you about this previous test was that um, moms who, rat moms who are super involved, who are what we, you know, we could say are good mothers, but that's really not a value judgment. That means they show high levels of licking and grooming. They're showing a lot of investment in their offspring. Those moms relative to low licking and grooming moms, um, sorry, yeah. So licking and grooming is LG. So moms who show high levels of licking and grooming relative to low levels of licking and grooming show increased oxytocin and dopamine expression in the MPOA. So this, these high investment moms are moms who are being really rewarded for those behaviors. So it's not an accident that those moms are showing a lot of investment um, in their kids. Blocking oxytocin um, in these moms, uh, blocking oxytocin receptors um, abolishes the effect of the increase in dopamine. 
So that if you infuse, obviously, yeah, this makes sense. If you infuse oxytocin into the rats and you block the oxytocin receptors, you don't get any increase in dopamine. So it's clear that it is oxytocin acting in the MPOA that causes dopamine to go up that makes interacting with kids um, rewarding. Okay, so those are the main points from these two experiments. So I hope that that helped. And I just want to tack on um, just something about paternal behavior. And what is he doing? Sorry, he's goofing around on the window over there. Anyway, um, okay, so I just want to tell you really quickly because this is going to relate to a little bit what we talk about in aggression. And I encourage everyone to check out this website, which shows in um, Swedish dads who are required to take more than. <laughs> who are required to take more than um, two months off for paternity leave. It's just a series of beautiful photos about what life would be like if that happened uh, in the state. So all these dads being really involved in childcare. Um, so the main point of what I wanted to show you here is that testosterone levels are tend to be depressed in humans and non-human animals, including apes and birds that show paternal care. So where the fathers are investing in the offspring, in order for that to happen, testosterone levels tend to need to go down. And testosterone levels are highest in single men who are unmated or unpaired who don't have offspring. So we see this in humans, and this is a study in humans showing this is testosterone levels over here. And this is just showing that married men with little kids have the lowest testosterone levels, and that's controlled for age and everything else. And uh, men who are single and uh, not in a relationship without kids tend to have the highest testosterone levels. So we talked about how um, testosterone um, helps sort of in individuals to make decisions in a sense about how energy is directed. And when testosterone is high, there's more men energy put into um, muscle growth, among other things, but also uh, changes in the nervous system that help the individual be more uh, responsive to cues in the environment of um, uh, fertile females, basically. Uh, and then that's just a replication down here of that same finding. I wanted to emphasize that this is a very robust finding in humans that is consistent with non-human animals where testosterone levels in men um, change, uh, apparently, to facilitate investment in um, mating. So here you have unmarried men with the highest testosterone levels, uh, married and children with the lowest testosterone levels, married, no children, sort of somewhere in between. And that's what you see up in here, paired and married um, without children. You have uh, levels that are right in the middle. And one more, which is just to show that oxytocin levels predict engagement with offspring in new parents. Uh, even in the dads, but what we see is that oxytocin predicts physical engagement with offspring. In moms, that's more affectionate, and with the dads, um, so there's Alex engaged in rough and tumble play with Griffin, um, so that the, the way that dads are investing that is predicted by oxytocin levels is more about sort of um, stimulatory play. So moms Moms with higher oxytocin levels are doing uh, more sort of affectionate physical engagement, and dads with higher oxytocin levels are doing more kind of rough and tumble stimulatory um, play with the kids. And that was the main point there. Okay, so I hope that helped, and um, let me or Giuseppe know if you have any questions. I think there was something else I wanted to say, um, but I forgot. But, oh, for the review session, I think this is a great way for me to supplement whatever we do live, that if you have questions, you have some slides or experiments that you want me to go over, I can try and do something like this. And I hope this helped. Let me know. And um, have a great weekend. And I'll see you on Monday.